Hello, hello. Welcome to another episode of the Wonderless Wealth Show. Today, we have my friend, Nick Cooley, who is a badass real estate investor, broker, and co-owner of Jericho Capital, who focuses on large commercial multifamily properties and generating passive income, right? Because we all are here for the passive income for investors. And okay, but really the crazy thing here, which I'm so excited to get into, is he started his real estate career. And I say he, like literally talking to you on <laughs> on live right now, but started it from sleeping in a car in 2014, which was 10 years ago, to now targeting a real estate portfolio of like $60 million, which is insane. Insane. So welcome, welcome, Nick, to the show. <laughs> yeah, it's, I've been looking forward to this. Thanks for having me. <laughs> I have been looking forward to it too. I'm always like so jazzed up whenever we get to chat because it's like all the ideas start flowing through the brain. I'm like, oh, let's freaking go. <laughs> love it. I think uh, like you alluded to, I think that's... I love sharing that part of my story because literally if I can do it, anybody can. It's just a question of uh, getting the right information and surrounding yourself with the right people. And so I'm, I'm excited to be in your circle. A hundred percent. Okay. Well, so since we're already going into that, like before the real estate investing, before the $60 million portfolio, before all of it, like who was Nick? Yeah. Uh, so it's a, it's a fun question. And just for the sake of like clarity, we don't yet manage 60 million, but that is the goal. I love uh, it. We, we frequently, uh, like we're writing a $60 million offer this week. So I, I'm sure we'll hit it soon, but. I, I want to be super transparent. I don't want to be one of the <laughs> online gurus that maybe is fabricating part of their story. Um, so my story, uh, I was pretty... Uh, I thought I was going to go to med school, honestly, through college. I uh, did the whole pre-med thing through undergrad. I was a two-sport athlete. And so to find myself in this scenario where I was like being forced to sleep out of my car at times was kind of uh, unexpected. Um, but uh, what it forced me to do was to reevaluate both my personal finance because I was spending like a dumbass to put myself in that <laughs> position in the first place. And then secondly, it also forced me to be like, let's, well, we have to aspire to having level 10 skills, but we have to do it in a level 10 opportunity. And so... I compare it a lot to like being the, Le the LeBron James of ping pong. <laughs> you can be the best in your league, but if you're not playing in the NBA or in our case, real estate, it doesn't have the same financial incentives that maybe ping pong might. Yeah. No. Okay. I love that. I love that. So, you know, I had literally no idea that uh, like originally you were planning on being pre-med. That's wild. So, okay, take me through why, I guess, let's let's start even before that. Why pre-med? <laughs> um, this is kind of funny. And this is probably uh, the most insightful as to why it didn't work out. But uh, <laughs> I grew up in a town of about a thousand people. And I was like a valedictorian, sedatorian at my class. Yeah, did pretty well on tests, but I definitely wasn't like a the best studier. Mm -hmm. uh, but I was like, oh, I'm a smart kid. Uh, I honestly thought going into medicine was how you could make money. Like coming from such a small yeah. market, I just thought that was what the trick was to to make a lot of money. And uh, as I got deeper into it, that wasn't enough to sustain me through uh, med school and all the rigors. Okay, I feel that so hard because that was literally exactly pretty much why I got into engineering, right? Because I was like, well, that's how people make money, right? Like you just go get a job in engineering, you're going to be fine. And then I started working and I remember getting my first few paychecks. And I was like, this isn't that much. <laughs> I was it's like, like wait, too hard for this. Yeah, yeah. exactly. <laughs> <laughs> and that's when I was like, hmm, I don't think like I I, do, I don't think I can wait another five years, ten years to get a promotion to maybe make fifty thousand dollars more. Like what? <laughs> <laughs> oh my gosh. Okay, okay. So you go into pre med, kind of go through that route. What, how was that transition out of pre med to then like you know the point where you say you're sleeping in your car and like why were you sleeping in your car? Let's kind of just like dig into that because I know there's a lot of people out there who are kind of like. You know, I I don't have a ton of money right now. Like I am barely making it. I don't, I can't even fathom, you know, becoming a real estate investor. So totally. I think really kind of going through that transition would help. Yeah, I, I'm happy to to share whatever. So 
Um, the the pre med and the falling out of of med school. I I'd applied to med school, and I to be honest, I'd I'd gotten accepted to some. Uh, but when I graduated through undergrad, um, in an attempt to bolster my med school application, you have to do two hundred hours of shadowing, right? And so I shadow one, two, three, like half a dozen or more doctors to check that off the list. So when I send off my application, every box is checked and I can be Dr. Cooley at some point. <laughs> um, without fail, every single doctor that I was shadowing at the time said, you know, if I were you, I don't know if I could do it all over again. <laughs> Every single one of them, like without fail. And, and you know, I'm, I'm 20, 21 years old. And at first I'm like, ah, what do these old guys know? You know, I'll be... But after you hear it, the exact same message over and over and over, you're like, shoot, there might, there might be something here. And so since I was an athlete, the only job that I could have to pay for my uh, bar tabs and, and books was I sold motorcycles through college, mm. which was awesome. It was a great yeah. job. Super <laughs> fun. Uh, but my first summer there, I was the number one sales guy on the floor. And I beat this like dude that had been there for 25 years, had like a ponytail all the way to like his butt crack. And I was like, it, it just came so naturally. Yeah. Right. And so it, it was an easy transition for me to be like, well, I have no idea what I'm going to do. I might as well sustain myself with my sales background and then whatever goes from there, I'll figure it out. So I'd, I'd go into that and like most athletes, I get into the personal training world right after college. And uh, this kind of leads into that question of where you said uh, how I ended up basically sleeping in my car. But um, <laughs> but man, it's such a multi-tiered story. So <laughs> I, I, I met my now wife, Hannah, uh, in Lincoln, Nebraska, which is where I was in this personal training world. And she was born, raised, nursing school, all in Lincoln, had never left the city. And her only, like her dying wish was to move somewhere warm. That was it. And so after three months of dating, I'm like, I know I'm going to marry this girl. And so I started applying for jobs in Texas. California and Florida, three <laughs> places that I knew were warmer than Nebraska. And uh, one of them hits and it's in Austin, Texas. And unfortunately, on top of my bad spending habits, I just wasn't saving enough. Uh, the second thing was my roommates at the time uh, basically blackmailed me and said, mm -hmm. Hey, your name is on the lease. And so even though you're living in Austin, you're going to pay for our rent in Lincoln. And uh, as me paving the way for my future betrothed, I also wanted to pay 100% of the rent in Austin. She oh, wasn't gone there yet. <laughs> and so I'm like this broke kid out of college with bad spending habits, paying for two apartments. And um, that was kind of what contributed to like, we're going to have to batten down the hatches and, and get yeah. through this. No. Okay. There was so much to unpack there. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. so so number one, like this, I love what you said about, you know, you talk to a bunch of doctors and they were basically like, don't do it. Because it's so crazy. I have a lot of friends who are doctors or they're in residency or something. And not one of them, not one would say, yeah, go into <laughs> medicine, like be a doctor. It's the best career ever. Totally. And like, it's kind of the same even with engineering. Like I remember just like going to work. And no one liked really what they were like. No one loved what they were doing, right? Everyone's just right. kind of there because they had to be, and I was paying the bills, and I was just like, "You're just living this life day in and day out." And I was just like, "That is just not the life I want to live." <laughs> yeah. How how frequently do you talk to engineers or doctors, and they're like, "Dang, I want to do what Olivia is doing." Like, oh, all the time, all the time. And I would <laughs> literally not change what I'm doing. Like, I love, I literally love what I do, <laughs> and that's such a freaking <laughs> blessing. But you. Know, me doing it like anyone else so like so many of my friends were in a way better financial position than I was when I got like first got started investing in real estate way better totally. financial position I, totally. I tell people I also had bad spending habits years ago when I got out of grad school I was in $25,000 worth of credit card debt because I was an idiot and well but in Balling. the best way I went traveling <laughs> I traveled so much I have 50 countries wouldn't take it back for anything but also it was a wake-up call to be like huh 
what? We go clearly something's not ticking. Here. Right. Yeah, it's it's a good lesson, right? Like, well, and my big takeaway from that in particular is you and I both started from not the best circumstances, perhaps, but it's it's just like a it's another positive review to the power of real estate if you can play it for a long enough period of time. Yeah. Years one through seven, I didn't really stand out from the crowd. But by doing the same thing over and over and over and still aspiring to be the LeBron James, but no longer of ping pong, but of <laughs> this real estate thing, like all of a sudden years eight, nine, and 10, I look like this overnight success. Yeah. But it's not my fault so much as it is I chose the right vehicle to try to achieve mastery. And yeah, well, and you just didn't give up. You, and you got started sure. and you just like, you know, <laughs> and I think so many people are trying to find that slam dunk deal for their very first property. And it's like, just start. Like, even if you start and you're like, actually, I hate this. And you sell your property and never get, at least you tried. At least you're not wondering. <laughs> totally. And I say all the time too, we're like, okay, let's, let's walk through that exact scenario. Um, all right. I'm a, I always pick on dentists. Shout out our uh, favorite real estate investors that are dentists. But, um, like you're a dentist today and you decide to rip the bandaid off and you try to become this real estate investor, whether you're doing flips or boutique hotels or whatever flavor of real estate speaks to you. And let's say it doesn't work out. Literally, your worst case scenario is you go back to the life that you're already living. Yep. You're already living the worst case scenario, dude. Like, <laughs> let me remove the suspense and, and just tell you, it's going to be fine. Whether yeah. it works or it doesn't, it's okay. Just give yep. it a spin. Hundred, hundred percent. Um, also, so another thing you talked about is like you went into sales, like, or you had some experience in sales. And I find this a lot with like really good real estate investors, right? It's like they have some sort of sales background. And it was so funny. But, and or they and they enjoyed it. They like genuinely enjoyed it. Because I remember... So one of the jobs that I did in college slash grad school was I did sold Cutco. And I remember yeah. at the time... Yeah, I remember at the time, so many people were like, what are you... You're going to go sell knives? But like I tell people all the time, that was the most impactful job that I had. Most impactful by far. And just seeing like what was possible and surrounding myself with other entrepreneurs, I was like, there's this whole other world that I'm just not aware of. <laughs> totally. Well, well, and you get like really good at understanding that if 99 people in a row tell me to pound sand and that I'm the devil for trying to sell them a sharper knife, <laughs> you realize that like, cool. They don't even remember who you are by the time dinner time rolls around. Yep. You know? <laughs> Like you're not that significant in the big scheme of things. So you may as well do what lights you up. Yes. Oh, a hundred percent. And also it just like got me used to being told no, right? Because think of so many people and it's so funny. So even when I look at a lot of the students in my program, some of them have come to me after trying to get into real estate for two years, three years. And it's because they maybe put one or two offers in and they didn't get it and they just like fell out. And it's like, you have to keep going. Like guys, I put, you put hundreds of offers in sometimes and you still don't get into it, but all you need is one. And it teaches totally. that tenacity. <laughs> totally. I, I used to, uh, sorry for the aside, we can edit this out if you, if you hate it. But um, <laughs> one of the things that I like encouraging people to do that don't have a sales background is to like one time a day have just, just this crazy ask. And the crazy is relative, right? But like if, if you're somebody that kind of struggles with rejection or if you're somebody that's like, oh, well, what, and what if they... Uh, what if they did... Like if you get nervous just thinking about making an offer, next time you go to Starbucks or wherever you get your coffee... Ask for them to just cover it. Like, hey, can I get this <laughs> latte for free? And you'll learn, like, again, 98.5% of the time, they'll be like, no, like, what, what card do you want us to use? But 1.5% of the time, you're going to end up with a free latte and you'll realize, dude, it's not like, it does happen. Just by making the ask, you'll get something done. And so yeah. then apply it to something that actually moves the needle instead of your caffeine fix. 
And all of a sudden, you get your offer accepted on a house hack that lets you live for free. 100%. Oh, okay. It's so funny you say that because my friends always make fun of me because they say that like I always get what I want. And it's literally just because I always ask. And I remember we were at the PCON last year and we were actually staying like at an Airbnb with a couple of friends and we went to go park and they gave us a ticket. I was like, no, 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 we're not paying this ticket. So I literally <laughs> went to the front desk and I was like, hey, for some reason, our like car doesn't comp. Can you get it comp for us? And they're like, yeah. I'm like, there we go. <laughs> Beautiful. Boom. End the show. Drop the <laughs> mic. Literally. I'm just I love that so I'm much. So many of the same stories. That's right. so funny. It's like just freaking ask. Just start. Like you never know. <laughs> exactly. Okay. So back on track. So you go from like living in your car in Austin to okay. Then how do you? Where is the getting into real estate part? Like how do you even think about getting into real estate? Yeah. Uh, so two things, and again, like trying to make this as transparent as possible. Uh, I do think, although that's where a part of my story kind of started, I did have a great advantage in that I, I I was good at sales, right? So although I was in a really bad spot, I was able to generate a, not a crazy income, but I was able to make like a decent income. Yeah, and real estate is a game that's best played for slow and steady gains and for tax savings. And so one of the advantages I did have was an ability to, to generate a better than average income. Okay. Um, secondly, the thing that I think was really impactful was a friend of mine that's now a, a mortgage broker. He got started in the real estate business right out of college. And so when Hannah and I moved to Denver from Austin, I think it was like late 2014. So maybe New Year's Eve 14 going into 15. I reconnect with my buddy that I played football with. And he was like, dude, dude, I've got this crazy thing. And he's working in real estate, right? And we're still like so close out of college. We're all broke. Just trying to figure out what direction we're going to start applying ourselves in. And he's like, there's these clients that I work with. They buy houses and other people pay them off. <laughs> like, <laughs> Crazy. That was how, I know. That, that was how he explained real estate investing, right? And now we look at it as like, oh, what's the DSCR? Right. What's the maximum LTV? <laughs> like we get so into the weeds, but it started at such a simple concept that at that point in time, the median house in Denver was like, 365 grand, 400 grand, something oh, like that. Oh boy. that yeah. Oh, how that's changed. Uh, yeah, Crazy. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, for sure. And um, it was a, it was like easy for me to be like, well, well, dude, if I had even just like five of those in 20 years, I'll be a millionaire. No problem. Yeah. And so it was, it was simple enough for me to begin taking action. And I didn't have to get hung up on the 97 different rules of how to get the perfect property to start off. Yeah. Okay. I freaking love that. So I guess even for that first property, how did you buy it? Was it just like regular conventional loan or what did you do there? Yeah. And what was, what was your strategy too? Like what kind of houses were you buying? Yeah. Great questions. Um, the very first property we ever bought um, was 2016, which was a pretty crazy seller's market in Denver. That was when Denver really started getting on like the national spotlight um, and uh, over asking offers all cash were not like 2021, but they were pretty common. And so we wanted to buy a place in Low High, which for those of you listening in Denver, you know exactly where that's at. Uh, but we kept getting outbid. We got beat like four times in a row. And so we're like, dude, screw this. Let's just expand our radius. Keep looking in the path of progress. But we ended up buying a place uh, uh, off market actually on Tennyson Street. Mm, wow. Oh my gosh. And Tennyson is like blown up. <laughs> yeah, we got lucky there for thinking action for sure. But we, uh, at that time, I was actually selling construction materials. So I would frequently just walk onto job sites that I had no business being on. And I would try to convince people to like buy from me instead of wherever they were sourcing their stuff from. And so I got the opportunity to walk onto this townhome site. And I'm not fluent in Spanish, but I'm conversational. So I get to start talking <laughs> with the guys. And uh, we ended up negotiating basically this townhome off market. Uh, we ended up buying it with an FHA, like 4% down uh, program that we ended up moving into, which influences the question that you asked about our strategy. 
Uh, at the time, I was super busy in my sales role. Uh, so <laughs> I, I didn't want to deal with tenants per se. Uh, so we thought... Well, so just so anyone who's listening and didn't see the YouTube video, those were air quotation marks around super busy because at the end uh, of the day, you can always make time for anything. <laughs> right. Well, like at that time, I was the busiest I'd ever been. You know, how could I ever work more than that? And right. I learned that that's not true. <laughs> but, uh, so we, we moved into that spot and we saw, uh, I, I want as little management headache as possible. And so I want to rent to people like us that have relatively decent W-2s that want to live in great areas. And luckily, that framework that my friend had told me on the New Year's Eve party, I didn't even take cash flow into consideration because I, I didn't want to quit my job. I, I, I like If you lock me in a room without something to do for longer than 15 minutes, I'll kind of start <laughs> going crazy. <laughs> But I did like the idea of having a portfolio at some point off on the horizon that I could then tap into and create an income out of that. Mm -hmm. And so we started buying in areas that didn't cash flow in markets that were overpriced in 2016 in Denver. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly. Uh, and so we started doing like the nomad style where we'd move into it. And then after we left, we rented it out, moved in, rented it out. And uh, we pretty quickly got into uh, a, a decent sized single family portfolio in Denver by prioritizing places that we wanted to live and just having like a really great fit for that uh, type of tenant that we were looking to have a, a place for. Love that. Okay. So now though, so did you, do I have this correct? Did you sell all of your single families or no? Okay, you did. did. So, so yeah, tell me about that transition, right? Because a lot of people think, okay, well, I'm going to buy like five or 10 homes, hold on to it for 30 years and then sell at 30 years or I have them all paid off and then that is my retirement. But you ended up not going that route. So tell me why, what did you get into later? All that stuff. Yeah, this is great. Um, <laughs> so, and if that's your thing, like, hey, more power to you. Like, I'm all for having three houses that are 100% paid off and that being your entire retirement strategy. If that's yep. what speaks to you, more power to you. Um, really, the deciding factor for us, and I say us because Hannah and I were, were equally yoked in kind of the single family business. And number one, I was aware of return on equity. Because we were buying our, our places with 4% down, Luckily, the market was appreciating like crazy during that run, but we were still probably at a relatively high leverage position, right? And in Denver, to your point, uh, it exploded in price since 2016. And here we were putting relatively little amount of money in to have a relatively big equity position that wasn't really making us any money on a monthly basis. Mm-hmm. Uh, and so that was a part of it that I was like, man, we should be, we're millionaires on paper, but it doesn't feel like it on a monthly basis. Yeah. So that was part of it. And then the, the really what kind of forced our decision was like, I believe God made Hannah for she and I to find each other and to like experience life together. Like I just believe yeah. that. And, uh, by the time we decided to sell, I had become a broker. And so I'm like just starting off my real estate broker career. I'm doing 12, 13 hour days. And Hannah at the time was in the emergency room as a ER nurse, also doing 12 hour days. And so here's this person that I think God designed for me to be my partner. She and I both have 12 hour days and I meet her at the door coming home from work. I take her bag, kiss her, welcome her home. And 80% of the time, the very first thing that would come up in conversation was... Did we hear back from the property manager about the burned uh. out light bulb at blah, 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 blah. <laughs> and, and I'm like, dude, but like, this is not why we sacrificed so much to build this portfolio. I, this isn't no. working. It's not what yeah. we built this for. And so I know there's a lot of people that uh, do succeed in that space as husband and wife duos. A lot of them are, you know, your and I friends. But um, for Hannah and I, it just wasn't the right fit. And so that made, the decision for us to uh, exit the single family portfolio and use that equity gain to basically fund our jump into commercial, which has yeah. uh, been going on since 2022. 
Okay, y'all, do I have something exciting for you? Now, I just came out with a brand new free training on exactly how you, yes, you can get started investing in real estate within the next three months. Because if you're someone who wants more freedom in your life, the ability to travel the world and do the things that you actually want to do in life, you're going to want to listen up. Trust me. Now, this training is freaking awesome. I literally go in and spill the T on the number one strategy that is working right now, like literally today in today's market. And I go over how to look at deals and make sure that they actually cash flow and how to set your properties up so that you can run them from anywhere in the world. Like I literally have managed my properties from over six different time zones. So if you are stuck in analysis paralysis, you don't know where to start when it comes to real estate investing, but you know that it's something that you want to do in the future, this training is going to be for you. So to check it out, click the link in the show notes or DM me the word hack, like H-A-C-K on Instagram, and I will send you the link. Now let's dive back into the show. Love that. Okay. So what kind of commercial are you in now? And then how do you have it? Like, is Hannah still a part of the commercial or not really anymore? Like how have you, I guess made changes to your relationship as well now that you've transitioned? Yeah. You're, you're asking great questions. Um, <laughs> I'm just so curious. <laughs> it's, um, so Hannah was pivotal in our single family business. I am aware of one, some of my shortcomings as a real estate operator. And some of them are... like I'm very fixated on revenue and growth. Very like sales guy default in that way. Hannah is... She's the person I give her a hard time for this, and I don't think she loves it. <laughs> That's <laughs> this is the analogy that I've stuck with. She'll she'll read an eighty page PDS and find where somebody owes us like two dollars and fifty cents. Oh my god! Like, <laughs> I'm like God bless her for it, but that is not my strength. And so, almost as a function out of necessity, she acted as CFO, CEO, mm-hmm. kind of through that scale. Um, and it's not to say that she doesn't participate at all. Like there are certainly times when I go to her and be like, hey, what do you think about this versus that? But it's very rare. I would say we talk about the commercial deals that we're doing. So like she checks on me and says, hey, how are you doing? Oh, great. Okay. And then it's kind of it. Uh, but she's aware, but I wouldn't say involved is kind of yeah. how I would explain. Awesome. And how has that like improved your relationship? been awesome. Um, and I, I'm probably sensitive to it because I like m- my marriage is the number one most important thing to protect. And so not that we like fought or that we um, it's not we didn't have any issues per se, but I think the fact that we have been able to separate as business partners because now she has her own medical clinic, she does her thing on this side. And I do the real estate thing on this other. Um, it, it just frees us up to be more husband and wife and less yeah. reviewing financial statements together. Yeah. And that's the thing. It's so different for every couple, right? Like there's some couples where they just, it fits so perfectly. And I think like everyone kind of glorifies that, but then it's really hard to separate like work and life and like, you know, pillow talk is talking about the properties and, you know, <laughs> So it's totally. like, you know, sometimes, and that's why sometimes it just makes sense to kind of have one person spearhead everything. They have that. And then you do your own thing and then you come together. And it's kind of nice too, because I think about even like when people work, right? They work different jobs and they come together. Then you have things to talk about. Like, how did your day actually go? What did you do? And you like kind of spark that curiosity again. <laughs> right. Hannah brought it up literally just this last weekend. We were talking about it with friends over brunch and... Uh, she said, uh, I think a part of the allure for that, because there's certainly a draw to like power couple, like we're building it together. And again, yeah. like if it's working for you, more power to you. I'm like, I love you and I want to see you succeed. Um, but I think part of the allure behind that is like we want to build something with the person that we love the most. Yeah. And it's okay. Like, uh, I'm telling you this from experience. It's just as sweet to reap the benefits of like building it, quote unquote, on your own as it is to build it with somebody. Because guess who you're celebrating it with? Yeah. The person you already love the most. Yeah. <laughs> like to, to your point, we would book, uh, you know, 
quarterly meetings where Hannah and I would go to a steakhouse and have a great bottle of wine. And we'd like, uh, is this a, or is this a date or was this the business meeting? Which one are we? <laughs> and it just, it wasn't the right fit for us, but that's not to say that it, that it isn't for, for everybody. So fair. So fair. Okay. Well, so tell me now about your commercial, like what, what kind of commercial deals have you gotten into? What are you doing there? Yeah. Uh, we prioritize because we kind of cut our teeth in the residential space. Uh, we prioritize housing. Uh, I'm a firm believer that regardless of whether or not the, the dollar fails and we are all using Bitcoin or nuclear war happens and we're using seashells, um, rent is still going to be due on the first and late on the third. Mm -hmm. And even if you're wearing a VR headset into the office, office, again, air quotes. <laughs> I didn't realize how often I use air quotes until uh, <laughs> I was on a podcast. <laughs> um, even if you're like wearing the Apple headset into the virtual office, you're doing that from a living room somewhere. Yeah. And so we believe that housing has a, at least a 100-year runway. Whereas we've seen there's some people in trouble with office because they thought that office was going to be around forever. And maybe that's not the case. Mm -hmm. uh, and so we prioritize multifamily, A, because it's, it was most akin to what we knew. And B, uh, because I think although there are higher uh, operational expenses because there's people involved, uh, it, it's a business that will be around for another 100 years. And so we like the risk-adjusted returns of that. I love that. And so, okay, so, and this is, I know, a question that a lot of people have because especially going from like smaller residential to larger residential, like how are you buying these deals, right? Because when a lot of, when, you know, when people think large residential deals, you're generally looking in the millions, right? So like, how are sure. you buying these? Yeah. Uh, so you've heard it on a podcast, Mr. or Mrs. Listener out there somewhere <laughs> in the metaverse that it's easier to buy commercial buildings. To a large extent, that's true. Like, I can buy a $100 million building easier than I can a $5 million single family house. Yeah. There's, it's easier to show why that asset is worth what it is. Uh, but there's a huge glooming like asterisk over here that in order to buy that $100 million multifamily property, you have to be an expert at understanding how value is created. And then you have to be able to communicate that to, for what we do, we raise money from passive partners. Uh, and then we invest alongside them in the deals. Love that. Amazing. Yeah. When that's the thing, it's like you don't have to even bring your own capital for a lot of these deals. That's why it's also, you know, you can do that for residential as well. And I've done that for a couple of residentials, but it's like yeah. so much easier <laughs> to do sure. that commercially because it's literally built for that. <laughs> right. And so that's going to be the part. Like if you want to get into the commercial part, test yourself and try to explain to a friend why you think the building that you live in right now is worth X. And then if you can understand the macroeconomic factors that are driving to a return at some point in the future, then great. Like maybe you can be buying these larger scale commercial deals. But what I've also learned in being in the space, and I think you've probably heard already, Olivia, is the, the deals themselves are more rare than the capital. Yeah. Like... We just printed, I don't know, it depends on which like meme you look at during COVID, <laughs> but we printed, let's call it like $20 trillion. I know that's not factual, but <laughs> we printed a shit ton of money. Money is not the scarce resource right now. It's somebody that understands how to utilize that capital and to create returns off of it. And if you can develop a track record for understanding risk, and for being able to put your partners in a scenario where you have the worst case scenarios planned for, and you're going to be able to take care of them and be truthful and like have honest conversations as you go through that transaction, um, you can find the money to do the deal. Yeah. No, that is so true. I mean, it's so funny too, because I remember during COVID, I was still like right at the line for getting a tax refund or not the tax, whatever it was. I forgot, you know how they send out random 
free cash. Although, is it free? Is anything ever really free, right? right. But, <laughs> but I was like, this is dope. <laughs> and now we're paying time, like triple bags. Literally so much. And like inflation is rampant. Buying a property is crazy and interest rates are high. And it's like, guys, nothing out there is fully free. (laughs) Um, Awesome. Well, so, okay. I have another question for you. So you became a real estate broker. So like you got your license, um, you actually sell real estate too. Why was that? Like, cause a lot of people come to me and they're like, should I get my real estate license? Like, what are your thoughts about that? <laughs> uh, I feel like this is the number one question that's going to get me kicked out of like the real estate circles. <laughs> no, I love <laughs> it. So, I'm glad we're talking about it. This is fun. It was, it was good to know you while I did. <laughs> so there's two questions there. Uh, I... Is it, why did I become a broker? Let's answer that one first. Um, After we built our single family portfolio, uh, I realized just how little most real estate brokers know about real estate investing. Oh, yeah. (laughs) If you look at the NAR data, like way less than uh, 50% of agents own real estate in general, let alone investment property, that number shrinks down to like 4%. Mm Mm-hmm. And so I was doing all the underwriting and I'd be working with this, this agent, this agent, this agent, whatever. And I'd be like, man, these guys don't know anything about how I'm evaluating this property. Um, I had done sales, 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 sales and tried like climbing the corporate ladder that way and realized I'm never going to be fulfilled working for somebody else. At some point, I'm just going to have to take the leap of faith and start my own thing. And upon realizing that I had a better than good chance at being a better resource for other investors than every agent that I had used up until that point, I made the I made the decision like, all right, let's give it a chance. Let's try to be a broker and see if uh, if there is like a need for somebody that actually is an investor friendly agent. Oh, Uh, I'm sure there was. (laughs) uh, So far, so good. Like, it's been awesome. Uh, and I, I, I do really enjoy that part of it, especially working with newer investors. The That's second- so real though, because like, so I, for example, I became my own agent in New Orleans for a couple of reasons too, is like, I, number one, was in a bunch of credit card debt and I was like, I need to make money. <laughs> <laughs> We're just going to keep it real around right. here. I love it. And then number two was, I knew I was going to be pretty picky just for what I was looking for. And I knew that I knew more about real estate investing than most other agents. And I was like, I'm just going to be my own agent and just like, like get my reps in, sell properties to other people, understand the transaction because I know I'm going to be doing this for the rest of my life. Um, but then the other thing is, is like, yeah, most brokers don't know anything. So even like my students in my coaching program, I like will literally cherry pick investors in different markets for them just because I know what to look for, right? And like, I mean, I've sent you you two people now too, because it's like, I know you're gonna you're gonna do great with that. Right? Yeah. So. I appreciate the vote of confidence. You, your <laughs> uh, your people are always fun to work with. <laughs> the uh, the second thing that I think is worth mentioning though, and this is maybe where why I fear getting kicked out of like the real estate. Uh, influencer crowd, but if you're just going to represent yourself as a broker, I don't think it's worth it. Totally. Oh, a thousand percent. It's not. It's a hundred percent not. You take on way more legal risk. Yeah. You, like you get nickel and dimed quite a bit. And so if you're somebody that has a sales background and you love real estate and you want to get into like a sales career, by all means, I think being a real estate broker is one of the best, like, avenues that you can implement to create active income. But what you're giving up, if you're like, Nick doesn't deserve two and a half percent of my purchase. (laughs) What's a broker worth anyway? Uh, Maybe that's true. Like I'll leave that up to you as the (laughs) listener to decide. But what you're losing if you make that decision is what real estate investors love more than anything. And that's leverage. You're going to completely rely on your market knowledge, your understanding of what off-market opportunities are available. Like It's all ride or die on Nick if I'm self-representing myself. Whereas if I'm an investor, like I I had a friend of mine that I texted earlier today that he does about 120-ish flips a year. You think he only works with one agent? Yeah. Not a chance. And because everyone knows, oh, Kyle's going to do this, this, and this, 
guess who the, he he gets the first call from eighty percent of the wholesalers in Denver. Yeah, and it's that leverage that is way worth more than that two and a half percent of unknown future value. Well, there's also, so like for me, for example, I literally just like did not enjoy being an agent personally. Like I, you know, you deal with a lot of people's emotions and especially when money gets involved and you're running around quite a bit as well. (laughs) Like there's so much more that goes into it. And also I just hated all the paperwork and all the random stuff. So like, (laughs) like all of it. And like, yes, you can hire a transaction coordinator. Now I have my VA helping me with a bunch of stuff, but still (laughs) it was just like, okay, if this is your like, oh yeah, I'm going to be a real estate agent and this is my ticket to like living my dream life and quitting every, I, like it's not, you know? <laughs> well, and go for it, right? Like yes. if, if you want to go and be Ryan Serhant yes. and like you or just whoever, right? Like there you go. More free publicity for you, Ryan, you dirty dog. <laughs> uh, Did sorry. you watch the new Netflix show? It's so good. Oh, <laughs> uh, no. No, here we go. We're, he's, he's, he's in our minds. His marketing. But it's good. so good. Literally, I watched, I binged it in a day and I was like, okay, I I, I honestly preferred it to like selling Sunset and stuff oh, just because okay. the real estate was really cool and it was less just like petty drama. And I was like, okay, this is really dope real estate. <laughs> new York versus LA. There's, yeah. there's a, a sub tweet somewhere in there. <laughs> Uh, but like, yeah, it's it's a great active income. But other than like getting a bunch of reps and understanding the the process, I'm not convinced that it makes you a better investor. And in fact, in many ways, I think it can be counterproductive to your efforts as an investor. Yeah. Be- because as soon as... Like, let's say that Nick the investor walks in uh, and I know that I want to build a portfolio that pays me 10, 15 grand a month, whatever the number is. Well, you know, I found this deal that I could do a burr on that could cash flow 1500 bucks a month. But if I sell it to Olivia, then I can get 20 grand today. And so I find that you're, it's hard to serve two masters, right? Yeah. At the same time. And so I think it can kind of cloud your judgment in which one you're actually trying to do. No, that is so freaking fair. Um, okay, so I, there's this one. So we're about to head to the last three final questions, but I want to ask you one more question, real quick. <laughs> so you live in a very affluent part of Denver, <laughs> <laughs> like the bougie, bougie part of Denver, and I love it there. <laughs> why is and you rent? So why is that? Uh, good use of capital. Mm-hmm. Um, <laughs> there's. So I view money as a tool to make me more money. Yep. And I think that people should own their house, uh, especially for three different reasons. Number one, if you can create monthly cash flow, aka house hack it, or turn it into an investment long term, all for it. Even at a 9% mortgage, if you can cash flow or buy into a ton of equity, that's still the right move for 99% of people. Uh, number two, I think once we retire, you're going to want your house to be paid off just to minimize expenses as you yep. are no longer able to create an income. And then number three, I think if you have kids, there may be some benefit for them growing up uh, with a backyard or part of like uh, a community where they have other friends that they can go play with. Other than that, I'm pretty... I don't want to say judicious. I'm pretty cutthroat when it comes down to if I put a hundred dollars out, that better be creating a monthly recurring for me. And if it's not, then you have to be ruthless to cut it out. And yeah. since we made the choice to leave the single family game, in order to your point, like if if a house that I would want to buy right now in Denver is probably a million and a half mm-hmm. or, or more. Like that would really kind of be just like yeah. where we're at. Um, that's going to cost me $400,000 in a down payment. And it's still going to cost me probably nine or 10 grand a month to pay for that thing. Yeah. Uh, nah, I think I'd rather pay 4,500 bucks a month in rent. Yeah. And instead take that 400, assuming that you still have it available to you. And I would rather go out and do a flip or do a deal because since we buy most of our stuff out of state, that 400,000 bucks could make me 
you know, thirty five hundred dollars a month. Totally. And all of a sudden, my rent is not free, but paid for because I elected to make that money work on my behalf. Hundred percent. And that's the thing. It really depends on like where you're at in your journey, right? Because you are also at the position where you know how to deploy your money, right? Like if you're just getting started, like house hacking is probably the move to go, <laughs> right? Sure. Because it's like you can minimize your expenses. But like once you've kind of gotten your reps in, that's when you can really start to look at, okay, well, let's really see where our money is going, what's gonna be the highest return on our investment and our like highest return on happiness. <laughs> For because sure. You know, like sometimes, like I remember, I know what you said too when you got your first property is you kind of like had to expand your radius. I did the same thing too in New Orleans where at first I was like looking in nicer nicer areas. And I was just like, I'm just not going to be able to find something I can cash flow in these on in these areas if or even break even if I am house hacking. And that was the goal. So yep. expanded my area a little bit and I'm like on the outskirts. Luckily, it worked out super well and I was in a fabulous location and I'm very happy with it. But, you know, at the time I was like, am I going to move into this? Am I not? Um, but that was also the sacrifice I was willing to make because I knew I wanted to get out of my job. I knew I wanted to transition my career. I knew that I wanted to become a real estate investor. Like that was the priority. Right. Well, and it's funny how that tends to work out, right? Like given, uh, if you ask anybody, hey, do you regret that real estate purchase that you made seven years ago? <laughs> <laughs> not, not very often. It's like, ah, the one, that, the one thing I could take back. You know, I wish I would have right. bought like, yeah, like, nah, I think we're okay. Well, yeah. It's like the only time I ever hear of people saying that they regretted it, it's usually if they sold too quickly, like they sold after a year or two or, you know, or like, or maybe they just bought like a really, really terrible property. But even if you buy a really terrible property, if you hold on to it for long enough, it's going to be just fine. <laughs> uh, the very first or not the first, but the second real estate deal we ever bought was a, still the worst deal I've ever bought. We, <laughs> we, we bought it. Uh, a week after we closed on it, we got a surprise fifty thousand dollars special assessment on it, Ooh. and this was a three hundred and twenty thousand dollars property. So fifty oh grand gosh. is a decent chunk of the total purchase price. Uh, we still own it today. Uh, it's <laughs> probably wor- that's the one single family home that we still own. Oh my gosh! It's worth four hundred now, and it breaks even on a monthly yeah. basis. So why like, did you keep it? I uh, that's probably why. Um, <laughs> I wanted to sell it, to be honest. I was like, let's, let's get rid of this thing. Uh, Hannah wanted to keep it. And I said we could as long as I never got bothered once about putting a tenant in it or fixing it. Oh anything. my God. <laughs> and so we still have it. So. That's it's, funny. To your point, right? Like even the worst deals, if you can just hold them for a long enough period of time, you'll most likely be okay. Yeah. Uh, I love that. Amazing. So now we are going to go into the final three interview questions that I ask every single person. So number one, what does your ideal perfect day look like? Ooh, my <laughs> ideal perfect day. Um, I wake up in a super bougie hotel. That's one Ooh, of my yeah. vices. <laughs> I'm a big... Uh, I'm, I'm known to splurge on a good hotel. From time I to time. love it. <laughs> Uh, and then uh, Hannah and I walk out to get a great espresso and maybe like a, a croissant or something uh, <laughs> overlooking the water. Uh, and then uh, from there, I would say I uh, drive along the coast to a Michelin star restaurant for uh, mm. lunch and a quick dip in the sea. <laughs> How's I that? love it. Sounds like Europe. So. Uh, yeah, I, was, I, I, I was kind of picturing uh, Croatia or something yeah. in my head. So. <laughs> oh, love, love, love that. Okay. And question number two What is your mantra? Two. Oh, my mantra? Um, personal or business? Both. <laughs> Uh, I don't know what you'll deduce from this, but the the number one thing that Hannah and I say most often in uh, in personal lives are uh, if we acknowledge a one-off behavior, it's our opportunity to extend grace. Hmm. Uh, But if we notice a pattern, then the onus is on us to make decisions uh, reflecting that pattern that we're seeing. I love that. I love that. And then as a business, I would say... Or as a business, I would say that in times of duress, 
you fall to your standards, not to your aspirations. Mm, yep. Yep. So if you that- want to improve your relationships or your fitness or your business, look at what you're deeming as acceptable around you and um, evaluate that. Uh, that is so true. And I always, it always goes back to like working out for me, right? Where it's like my standards over time have kind of shifted. Whereas like, bef- and I'm getting back to where I used to be, but before I was like the fitness queen, you know, like, and there was no world that I wasn't working out at least four to five times a week, like literally no world. And then like, as I got into corporate America and I, you know, life happens, all of that stuff, but I let life happen to me, right? Instead of yeah, like sure. m- keeping it as my standard. And so now I'm working back towards like making that the standard again so that even when it's a bad day, even when you don't feel like it, you still go ahead and you go do it. It's Just like, like you one- do brushing your teeth and you know. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's the one thing that you can't buy, right? Yeah. Like if you're in shape, like you earned it and it yeah. shows that you're dedicated and disciplined to do the thing even when you don't feel like it mm-hmm. for a long period of time. Yeah. And so I, I'm right there with your girlfriend. <laughs> Love it. Okay. Last question for you. What does wealth mean to you? The ability to say no to the I shoulds. Ooh, yeah. <laughs> uh, um, well, you know, one of our one of our big investors is in town and we really feel like we should probably go out and grab drinks with them. Oh, you know, there's that conference that's in town. I should probably go swing by and network. It's complete and shameless ownership over your time. Yeah. Gosh, I love that. I love that so much. Because even when I'm like, you know, building my one of my businesses right now, like the Wonderless Wealth Academy and everything, I had hired a coach to help me out. And I was like, oh, well, they found success this way. I should do it that way. The second I started doing the shoulds, everything just kind of went downhill. And the day I was like, no, I am doing this my way. It was like the heavens had broken open. And like- yes. <laughs> yeah, because there, there are people that make $10 million a year but they had better be on the Zoom call at Tuesday yeah. at 4 p.m. or hell will like freeze over. Yeah. And so in many ways, if you can walk your dog on Tuesday at 4 or go grab a <laughs> beer uh, at some brewery or whatever, go to work out, like you're experiencing a level of wealth that uh, many will never uh, accomplish. Yeah. Yeah. I love that. This has been such a fabulous conversation and a fabulous episode. Nick, where can people find you, reach out to you? Maybe they either want to invest with you or buy a property here in Colorado. Yeah, I I love talking real estate. A big part of me being uh, so involved is because this is what I was doing for free anyway. Uh, So if you do want to chat about either what we have going on at Jericho or are looking for a property here in Colorado, the easiest way to get all to me is probably Instagram. And uh, my handle is I'm, I am Nick Cooley. Love it. Well, thank you so much, Nick. This was awesome. <laughs> yeah. I'm looking forward to the next one. I'm inviting yes. myself back. You can't stop Absolutely. me. freaking <laughs> Louie. <laughs> Awesome. Thanks for having me. Thank you. Thank you so much for listening to Wonderless Wealth Show. Now, don't forget to follow the podcast or if you're watching on YouTube, make sure to hit that subscribe button. If you love this episode, it would literally mean the world to me if you shared this with a friend or a family member or literally like anyone off of the street. (laughs) Like right now, go ahead, share it so you don't forget or post it on social media and make sure to tag me. I love seeing what you're listening in on and what you resonated with. And I'm just so freaking thankful for you. I'm so freaking excited for you. I love you. And don't forget, life really doesn't have to be hard.